da, 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 da. Hey, welcome to the second follow-up episode. Now, unlike the other Game Dungeon episodes, this one assumes you've seen the ones that came before it. If you haven't, this is going to be kind of like walking into the middle of somebody else's conversation. Except without the awkward looks. Oh no, Steve's angry at Roger. I wonder who these people are. Anyway, if you're a fan of voyeurism, you may enjoy this episode. Oh, and check out the credits. We have a fan art submission this time. Let's go. Yeah, you thought I wasn't gonna jump back into the same game again, huh? Well, much like the game itself, Carnival keeps returning to me like a curse. Okay, help me out, guys. I don't remember every last word I say in the videos. So did I say, if you see a Carnival machine, please send me a photo of it? Because it sure seems like I did. I don't even know how many photos or reports of Carnival sightings I've received. Sorry if I missed anyone. I can't keep track of all this. That's the whole point. These keep coming in, too. They haven't faded off. Guys, you can stop. Seeing a photo of the arcade cabinet doesn't do anything for me. If I can play the game and it's really close to the original, or hell, is even better in some ways, then I'm good. I'm not the sort of person who needs the 100% authentic experience. That's what the time machine is for. I mean, the arcade cabinet poster is pretty awesome. This should help take your mind off any other problems you may be having. But you don't need to send me any more photos. I'm just glad we have emulators so anyone can take a shot at the game now. It takes less quarters, too. And speaking of which, this is going to become less relevant as inflation marches on, but did you know that while quarters are larger than nickels, they're pretty similar mass-wise, since nickels are thicker? So if you take a hammer to a bunch of nickels and flatten them out to the width of a quarter, there are plenty of machines that will think they're quarters. 80% discount. I mean, you probably shouldn't do that because it's illegal and time consuming, but it does work. And while I'm on the topic of illegal things, the internet has spoken on what it thinks of piracy. Now, it's my belief that piracy is always justified if that's the only way to still play a game. I don't care what the law says about that. It's wrong. Well, I asked you guys what you thought, and you took it one step further. According to the internet consensus, piracy is okay anytime you have a company that stops selling its game, and the only way to get a legitimate copy is through leftover copies floating around on eBay or specialist vendors. And remember, these are just the internet people piracy laws. Under actual US law, all piracy is illegal under any circumstances, forever. Because that's reasonable. The point here is that you should use common sense and the cops aren't going to break down your door and put a gun to your head for pirating a game that the company is literally not even selling anymore. Don't sell crack out of your house though because they will break down your door for that. Eterno! Well, viewer Alex Holland has sent me an awkwardly scanned authentic English manual to the game. It's only a little less bizarre to read than the translated copies. Reading this feels like talking to someone half senile, where they have coherent individual thoughts, but their mind drifts so easily onto something else without warning. You can download it in the description. Okay, that's it. Potty Pigeon. Not a whole lot to say on this one. I guess one thing I feel kind of dumb about is that Potty Pigeon was in no way remarkable about having Player 2 joystick control the game while Player 1 is random garbage. When I made this episode, it had been a while since I played a Commodore 64 game and I honestly forgot. Because some games Player 1 works, some games Player 2 works. Sometimes the joystick doesn't work at all, sometimes they both work. Everything was a giant mystery with the Commodore. I think the Commodore 64 brings the player closer to madness than any other gaming platform. Not fury or rage, plenty of platforms can do that, but actual madness. Also, several people mentioned the game Wonky Pigeon, which has the same concept of potty pigeon crapping on cars. It's gotten terrible reviews because apparently it's broken, plus I'm not sure it has quite the spirit of potty pigeon. See, Potty Pigeon has a classiness to it. English countryside, historic ruins, all creatures great and small music. I really think for a pigeon crapping game to be successful, it needs that contrast between high society and bird shit. 
That or the game itself could be a chaos simulator where you have to time your crabs just right in order to cause accidents, start fights, ruin business meetings. There's a lot of possibilities there. Anyway, those are just my thoughts on the genre. I can't say this is a game I'm dying to see more of, but knowing the internet, I'm sure someone out there is. Helios! Well, I have some good news on this one. Sean Puckett was tracked down, or at least the closest thing we have to him still on Earth. He says he enjoys very difficult games that don't pull cheap tricks on you. And from here, things get confusing. In 2014, I got in touch with him and he told me he made the game Trichrome, which was another difficult puzzle game. He gave me a link to it, which did work, I saw it, but now, this is all I get. He also told me he honestly couldn't remember the ending to Helios 2. Two years later, I get another email from him or somebody claiming to be him from a different email address, this time unprompted, and all it said was the ending to Helios 2 was nothing special. It's as though he was trying to beat it again himself that entire time. Meanwhile, I also had two or three viewers contact me and tell me they were going to beat Helios 2 and would send me video evidence as proof once they did. I haven't heard back from any of them. To the best of my knowledge, I'm not sure anyone has beaten this game. If they have, then my earlier theory of it signaling the mothership may still be valid, because no one is around to tell the tale. Honestly, I doubt this one is worth the effort, because these are aliens we're talking about. For all we know, they don't have a concept of a game ending. Sean Puckett could have just patched in the Helios 1 sequence to make it an ending. It's like I said before, when you're dealing with aliens, you can't assume anything. Arcade America. One thing I forgot to mention in this episode is there's an extra layer of badness to the gameplay here. When you jump, after a certain point, instead of carrying your momentum like you would think, it's like you hit an invisible wall and just drop down instead. This is hardly the first game to do this, but man, it really doesn't help anything. It caused me to undershoot some jumps. Ah, this game. Now when I made this video, I asked for stories of politicians engaging in not-so-slick crimes, and there was a range in the answers. A lot of people sent me faux pas of things politicians said or dumb things in their past, and a couple in South America sent me ones of essentially dictators that were more tragic than anything else. Most of them didn't hit the Derek Shepard level of remarkability. It's not every politician that breaks into his girlfriend's house, punches her, steals $100 in her cell phone, only to get arrested with strippers later. So out of all the submissions sent to me, I think the closest story we got was Leland Yee. Leland Yee was a former state senator of California and was found guilty of accepting bribes from undercover FBI agents and more importantly, trafficking illegal firearms into the country. The irony is this was going on despite him having campaigned as a gun control advocate. Tell me that does not sound like the plot for an 80s cop action movie. I can see it now. Two rival cops team up to crack an illegal arms dealer case, which leads them all the way back to the state senator. With the climax of them getting in a shootout with dozens of his henchmen, rushing to get to him in time before he gets away by helicopter. I mean, that last part didn't happen, but come on, we're halfway there. And since this is the game dungeon, I didn't know this until I started making this episode, turns out he also authored a bill trying to ban violent video games, which the Supreme Court found unconstitutional. So he was making friends on all sides. Corrupt politicians are nothing new or unusual, but a simultaneous gun banning and gun running state senator? That's something special right there. Finally, a million people told me that the phone call I couldn't understand was talking about plumber's crack. I shouldn't be surprised with Joey here. In my defense, listen to this enunciation. Joey! Yeah! This is people from Plumber's Local Union 101. I can appreciate this though, since every character in this game is super expressive. And when you do voice acting, sometimes there's a direct trade-off between how much energy you put into your lines versus how easy it is for someone to understand you. Revenant! 
Well, the first thing you may notice here is I found an early version of the intro on the concept artist's homepage. So it looks like Locke wasn't always going to be rocking the Stallone-ish looks he ended up with. Besides that, this game has been rescued from Abandonware and is now being sold on GOG, and they ended up fixing that damn magenta text bug. It looks like the music really was corrupted too, since their copy of the soundtrack isn't any better than the originals. Now I almost put this in the original review, but I lost my source so I didn't. But I had read somewhere that this game got rushed out because the developers originally had something far more ambitious plan, but ended up just needing to slap it together and get it out the door before they went out of business. Now since I made the episode, I did read that again, but I still forget where. At least now I remember that was real and not my imagination. This is really how a lot of my casual research and knowledge on topics works. It's a result of me thinking, oh, I know I read that somewhere, then not knowing where the hell that was. My whole life is a little like that, really. Now, when I played this, I had some difficulty with the combat, and I received a lot of feedback on that. It seems like everyone had a different comment on this. The one thing that was clear was that I was underutilizing the combos. So here I am with no cheats, fighting with as many combos as I have available at this level. They do help, and I can really slash into people now, but good god. My stamina drains like I just woke up and haven't eaten breakfast yet. My stamina bar is depleted by a fight with one enemy for the most part. So I have to kill a guy, then just stand around and admire the scenery while I wait for it to replenish. Otherwise, I'm gonna have problems. And god forbid the enemy push me back to where I've already been. Because of course, let us not forget, enemies respawn as soon as they get out of sight. So now I'm sandwiched between two guys ready to kill me. I tried blocking more too, and you would think that after blocking a blow, that would create an opening where I can attack? Well, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It just feels semi-random. Most games that have all these combat mechanics tend to have a more established pattern to your enemies. But in Revenant, everything feels frantic and unpredictable. And speaking of which, it still feels very much like a dice toss how much health I'm going to walk away with after every encounter. Considering how many potions and food I need to chomp down to stay where I am, this doesn't feel sustainable at all. I mean, obviously it's possible since somebody's done it before. I could just save and reload constantly because that's fun, or I could just stand here and wait for my health to regenerate with a special ring. But my conclusion stands that this combat is a chore. A chore where you die. To cap it off, here is my favorite comment on it. One of the best game I have ever played. Way ahead of its time. Difficulty spikes were frustrating. They made me destroy my keyboard for the first time. Bartek Birbash. Moving on, regarding the frame rate, I had a lot of people state that tying the game speed to a low frame rate is a bad practice and the developers should have known better. I had almost as many people say that this bad practice is very likely to continue for the foreseeable future. I also had several people ask how I limited the frame rate in the first place. So here you go. I used a program called Nvidia Inspector and set the game to VSync at half the rate. But it has a frame limiter option too. This is also how I unlock super secret anti-aliasing settings on a lot of stubborn games. If you don't have an NVIDIA card, I think the program Radeon Pro for AMD cards does something similar, but I've had less luck in getting games to obey all the custom settings with that in the past. Alternately, you might be able to use the program DX Wand? DX Wand? I used this one for Baldi, since even 30 frames per second was too fast for that game. That's kind of how all this stuff works for Game Dungeon. There's no one program to solve everything, I just keep running more programs until I have no certainty of anything in life. But yeah, 30 frames a second. And finally, I have one more important item here. Since I made this episode, viewer Chris Cogden has contacted me about having access to a high-end printer and has offered to print a full, professional, poster-sized version of the Island of Aquilon for me if I finish mapping the game. According to him, it can be up to 44 inches wide and whatever length I need it to be. So now I have to finish it. 
I'll have to get a frame for this sucker too. I'll update everyone on that once I'm done, though it will be a while since the image is massive. It's only about a third done and is around 24,000 by 10,000 pixels. And to quote him, in a year's time we'll probably have both forgotten about this. We'll see. Oh, I won't forget what you said, Chris. The Last Stand. Okay, let's get one thing out of the way right off the bat. A lot of fans got riled up on my comment in this episode about the movie Aliens being better than Alien. Saying I'm a Philistine who can't appreciate something without a bunch of action. So why don't we clear that up? I like slow movies if they're done well, but that's not quite what Alien is. The first half of Alien is awesome. Great build up, lots of tension, good characters, mystery and intrigue, no complaints from me whatsoever. The second half is the protagonist wandering around corridors for 20 minutes at a time, doing nothing at all, then BOO! Spooky alien! Okay, another 20 minutes, nothing at all happening, BOO! Alien! And that's pretty much the rest of the movie. This is the part that feels lame to me. I feel the same way about Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Awesome start, kinda weak finish. Now we look at aliens and we have the same intrigue, plot build up, Good characters, then BAM! It's non-stop survival situations for the rest of the movie. Then a freaking boss fight at the end. It's just paced so much better. The thing about wandering corridors in a scary movie is at some point, something needs to be happening. Otherwise, it's just da 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 And while we're talking about things that are not zombies, a lot of people were quick to point out that the reason Final Fantasy is named how it is was that it was really a Hail Mary attempt from the developer where they thought this was going to be their last game, as opposed to what may be the longest running RPG franchise today. This one's my bad. Like a lot of the Halloween episodes, I was under the gun for time, so I was spending every spare minute trying to finish it up and ended up not researching that as well as I could have. But you know what? I didn't hear any comments about Final Fight. <clears throat> okay, so back to the game. When I made the episode, I had several reports of people telling me that the game actually ran slower then as opposed to when it first came out. I have absolutely no surprise that Adobe Flash could have become even slower over time. I do have a faster CPU now, but I'm still getting some chuggy. Also, several fans were quick to point out that a chainsaw would be a terrible weapon for the zombie apocalypse because all the blood would gum up the chain and cause it to jam. That's a really valid point I hadn't given much thought to. I admit, I don't have a lot of experience hacking up human bodies with power tools, so now we know. But the big news is in the original episode, I skipped The Last Stand Union City, because I like my games in full screen. I must have had a dozen people telling me what to do to play the game in full screen, and nothing worked. I tried it on Firefox, Chrome, Opera, this screen would always turn yellow right here. Well, I fired up the game again to re-record it for this episode, and now it works. I don't know what to say besides Flash has updated since then. And if that's not enough, I was able to run the game offline too. So that's a serious 180 for me. The game still chugs pretty hard, but I'm so happy about the other changes, I can't really complain that much. To be fair, I am running what was meant to be a game in a small window at full 1080 resolution, so it was never designed to do this. Most games usually run faster as technology gets better, but there are some where you can have the fastest computer in the world and it seems to make no difference. In any event, the game is completely playable now, even if I may want to consider a resolution drop on this one. So I guess that means I have to cover what's supposed to be the best one of the series. This is a pretty full game though, so I think it's going to need its own video. I'll cover that closer to Halloween. I say Halloween because if you know me, every day is a good day for the zombie apocalypse. But come on, I have to give other games a chance too. Finally, I noticed that the- Uh oh, looks like the secret follow up alarm triggered. Here we go. Okay, so as some of you know, I'm actually stranded on the moon. 
In addition to Ross's Game Dungeon, I tried experimenting with the show documenting this, but it didn't go over so well, since it turns out that there's not much happening on the moon. In the first episode, I played the game Cyril Cyberpunk. So here's the abridged version on that. In the year 2224, you play Cyril Smith, who intercepts an alien evasion and transforms into Cyril Cyberpunk to go stop them. They're all bears. Cyborg bears all over the place. Everything is a bear. The music is pretty great, the animation is fluid, the level design is soul draining, and there are a lot of levels. The whole game is a fever dream of maze-like levels and bears. See, yeah, we know they're not in business anymore, but we don't know why. I'd love to get like an interview with the people who made this and find, or just anyone involved and just find out what happened. I feel like their answers are gonna depress me though. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm still on the moon. Now, if you watched the last video, or one before that, we played Cyril Cyberpunk with Tom White from We Are Video Games. Uh -huh. Well, not only is he back, but someone else saw it, Stuart McIverath, the lead programmer of Cyril Cyberpunk. So we brought him on and we're gonna ask him some questions. That's right, Stuart McIverath, one of the original programmers, came on to interview with us and answer our questions. And to add to the suspense, everybody was supposed to record themselves locally for a higher quality copy, but something went wrong on Stewart's end shortly into the interview and the rest of his video was lost. But thanks to me being paranoid that something would go wrong, I recorded him on my end anyway, just in case. So not only is this a unique interview, but it's a salvaged one at that. The entire interview is almost an hour long. There will be a link to it in the description of this one, but here's a few highlights. Okay, now from the credits, it looks like Gary Morris was the head guy on the project. Gary, Gary was the sort of the orchestrator of everything. He, he uh, yeah, so he was the mastermind. Basically, we moved into his house. Um, we took over his house. We moved into the basement. I think we chain smoked night and day for a year. Um, and he would come in at night and give us food and tell us to go home and then come in the morning and give us food and tell us to go home. We were a bunch of guys that did it for free, essentially, for, a, for about a year. Uh, yeah. No one took a paycheck and we were working pretty full time. And uh, yeah, and then he disappeared. <laughs> so uh, oh. yeah, yeah, I, I, I bumped into him a couple of years later selling <laughs> Spoons on the side of the road. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Never to come back. The game is over. Um, and it, yeah, it, it had cycles like that, right? I mean, he was <laughs> pretty up and down type of guy. The way you're describing him, I'm almost imagining that if he hadn't been working on this game, he might have ended up being a cult leader or something. <laughs> the other way here. Yeah, no, he was a big personality, that's for sure. Actually, let's jump to that. Do you know that? Was there any story behind the obsession with bears in the game? I mean, that was Gary's turf. No, obviously, idea. but but <laughs> I mean, he never explained himself. Just bears. This is what we're doing. <laughs> like that. That's a, just. Uh, just yes. Why are we? Shut up, bears. He's also working on what looks to be a much better game, Discrepant. It's going to be a surreal science fiction game with what's hopefully a strong story element. This will date the video, but he's currently looking for assistance in a few areas. You can contact them here if you're interested in helping out with that. And hey, for everyone else, this could be a game worth playing once it comes out. So I guess you better do a good job, Stuart. Polaris Snowcross. Well, the first thing I want to say is I am so happy I got this shot right here. This feels like getting Bigfoot on video for me. Because the computer was doing this the entire game, but you never got to see it. And here it is. Although we only have this because I was using my crippled AI. If I had left this on the default settings, they would keep doing this, I would just never see it and I would never win. But it's a conundrum because you would never even see this level playing this game legitimately. Some people thought the sticky keys thing in the video was an intentional joke. Oh, I tried to turn it into a joke, but that really happened as you saw it. I was running this under a virtual machine, so of course a fresh copy of Windows turned them back on. How many times do I have to turn off default Windows crap? For the rest of my life, that's how much. 
Next, volunteer Brian Shooter managed to get the headlights working in the game. He recorded this night footage you're seeing here. I'm so happy when I feel like I'm not crazy. This is what the game was supposed to look like at night. He did this by running the game in Linux under Wine. Go figure that the best way to run an old Windows game is on Linux. Brian also got a stopgap method of anti-aliasing working with FXAA. I tried to do the same thing when I recorded this episode, but it just wouldn't take running on a virtual machine. Between modern Windows and Linux, compatibility on old games is all over the map. I get worried as we march forward some games aren't going to run correctly on either one or under a virtual machine. FXAA and SMAA are both cheat methods of anti-aliasing. They work great in some situations and never work in others. They unfortunately don't fix what drives me crazy, which is the shimmering you see in a lot of games. Glah. Unlike traditional anti-aliasing methods, which use 3D geometry to figure out what the image should look like, these use black magic and just guess. They don't need any 3D data at all. I have to say though, as much of a freak as I am about anti-aliasing, it's slowly going to be less of an issue as time goes on. Computers are getting more powerful and the industry is aiming for 4K screens and beyond. Now I'm fine with lower resolutions myself, but only if they have decent anti-aliasing. If not, well, once the pixels get small enough, I stop noticing the problems. And yes, this is kind of obsessive, but I think I figured out why it bothers me so much. See, this small flickering, I think, triggers the same part of my brain that thinks there's a bug flying around, like a gnat or something. So my brain doesn't let it go. It wants to kill it. I kind of hate bugs and want to kill all of them, even though that would mess up the ecosystem. Anyway, if this doesn't bother you when you play a game, more power to you. I'm jealous. Oh, and there's been no update on the human bones found at Point Defiance. And that's the end of this follow-up episode. There will be more in the future, but making these is kind of like returning to a crime scene and explaining to the neighbors why people got stabbed. It's a lot easier to just create new crime scenes. Okay, stay tuned for the next episode for Tides of Weirdness. It's going to get weird.